Hi, this is Jonathan Marks, and I'm here today with Ron Kessler, Ph.D. He's the McNeil Family Professor of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School. He's also the co-director of WHO, the World Health Organization, and the World Mental Health Survey Initiative. He's a member as well of the National Academy of Medicine and National Academy of Sciences. And he's going to be speaking at the upcoming meeting of APSARD, the American Professional Society of ADHD and Related Disorders. That's this January 13th to 15th at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. Ron, can you tell us what you'll be presenting? Well, I'm going to be presenting the results of a methodological analysis that I carried out with uh, Lynn Adler and Steve Ferrone and Tom Spencer from MGH on the revision of the ASRS screening scale for DSM-5. Uh, the ASRS is, a, as you might know, a widely used, very short screening scale for adult ADHD. And it's something that can be used in a primary care waiting room or in a workplace setting in uh, you know, HRA surveys. And it's uh, very often used uh, when people say they are concerned about having problems and a clinician can pull out the short scale and very quickly a score it. Uh, we developed the scale 15 years ago or so, and it has uh, it's now used all around the world in 30 or so different languages, and has really been uh, instrumental in advancing the, uh, the the realization that so many people have adult ADHD. But uh, as you also know, a DSM-5 just uh, in recent years changed the diagnostic criteria for adult ADHD so that. The, the criteria really reduced from what they were before. It used to be six, six symptoms, and now it's five, and there's some changes in impairment and age of onset and so forth. And so it was time to update the scale. We were fortunate that we had a couple of large clinical reappraisal samples where we had state-of-the-art diagnostic semi-structured interviews administered to people by clinicians who were experts in adult ADHD to come up with gold standard diagnoses. We also administer to those same people the, the full set of questions that are in the, in the long version of the ASRS. And we were able to do reanalysis of those data to come up with the DSM-5 definition because the changes in DSM-5 are such that when you have a really in-depth clinical interview, you can change the criteria to come up with a DSM-5 definition. So uh, that's what we did, and we were fortunate that in doing this, we uh, collaborated with a young guy from MIT named Bert Houston, who has, it just so happens, has recently developed a, a new fancy method for creating easily scored screening scales. It's a method that's called SLIM, and SLIM stands for Super Sparse Linear Integer Models. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is the basic idea is that for clinical purposes, very often we want to ask a small number of questions and on the fly be able to come up with a score. And You can't do some fancy kind of thing where you have 27.2 times something or other divided by the square root of, you know, you have to, you know, on a piece of paper be able to do it and add right. it up with a pencil. And so he's come up with some very fancy machine learning, elegant methods for saying if we wanted to create a short scale that was very easy to score, so each, each item only has a score of one, two, three, four, or five, mm -hmm. how, would you, uh, how would you optimally do it? Now, in, in a typical scale, when you say, well, how often have you had the following symptoms in the last six months? You know, often, sometimes, rarely, never, you might give a person a score of one, two, three, or four for that and just add up the scores. And that's pretty much the kind of thing we did uh, when we developed the uh, the ASRS originally, except we did something a little bit fancier than that, and that is you don't always have to have a score of one, two, three, and four. So if somebody says never, a little of the time, some, and a lot, well, if never is a like say let's say never is a zero, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean a little, some, and a lot is one, two, and three. It might be zero, five, six, seven, because even a little of something. I mean, in other words, if somebody says how often have you thought about killing yourself? Well, even a little is a big deal. Right. So somehow psychologically, uh, the distance between these things is not necessarily the same. 
And when we developed the original ASRS, we used kind of an ad hoc method of uh, investigating that by creating separate scales, separate yes-no scales, saying, did the person say it happened at least a little of the time? Yes, no. Did they say it happened at least some of the time? Yes, no. Did they say it happened all the time? Yes, no. And we put these into regression equations that allowed us to come up with different weights for those things. And uh, at the end of the day, we developed a, uh, an ASRS quick scale that took that into consideration where we, we said that even a little bit of some symptoms counted as being important, whereas you had to have them some of the time for, you know, had to have a little bit more often for others. And there are some symptoms that are so common uh, that they had to happen really all the time, you know, a lot of the time to be considered clinically significant because everybody, at least some of the time, has certain kind of things. Right. So that was the idea. But he's really taken this up five notches from where we were. He's developed these things called, there's these things called machine learning methods, which are these very fancy methods for doing artificial intelligence kind of stuff. And he essentially said, if every thing that a person says can have a score between zero and five, it has to be monotonic. It could be like zero, five, 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 five. If you say never, a little, some, a lot, all the time. Yeah, because so that would show it's really thing. important. Like yeah, that, that was just suicidal even a little, thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Suicidal behavior. And, and whether, you, whether you hear voices three times a day or one time a day, you're off the charts, you know, kind of thing. And so uh, it's just, do, does it happen? Yes, no. If you think of it that way, with six questions, with five things, each one of them can have between zero, one, two, three, four, or five as scores, and you sort of multiply out all these combinations to get the best six out of 30-some questions, it turns out there's literally tens of millions of combinations of different things. He has this optimization program he's developed with supercomputers that essentially scans through these tens of millions of possibilities. It's a brute force method. The elegance in it is that it searches in such a way that you can do it in, a, in an hour or so to have this thing converge. That's what we did. We developed, we used this slim model, it's called, and it turns out that we got a very elegant solution. It turned out to be exactly six questions, which was what we had the last time. And the way it was scored was quite different. A score of zero, 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 three, and sometimes it's zero, three, 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 and sometimes it's zero, one, three, three, three. But the idea is because we had such a large sample, we were able to optimize this subtle variation. And because of that, we got incredibly high concordance with clinical diagnoses. So well over 90% of the time, we're now able to reproduce what a clinician would independently do with the scale. Whereas originally when we did the same thing, kind of a seat of our pants version of this 15 years ago, it was only around 70%. So mm -hmm. we've dramatically improved the precision of the scale. That's amazing. Updated the scale. Yeah, it really, really is just unbelievable. We're like the second or third people who have ever used this method, but it's going to be something that from now on everybody's going to use because there are just so many places where you can imagine having things and doing insomnia studies, for example. They're doing work now where they have polysomnographs. So, you know, going off and having to have be in a sleep lab overnight and, you know, $2,000, but just having a quickie little six or eight question scale, you can screen out the vast majority of people who don't have it uh, in two minutes using this slim method. I'm going to assume, Ron, that you're going to end up with still a six question piece of paper, but the questions will be different and they will be more weighted so that the physician can still score this in the office. Yes, exactly right. So it used to be that we had a sh six questions and they were shaded. So it said, you know, how often did this happen? You know, right. never a little, some, a lot. And for the shaded responses, some, a lot, all the time, you count them up. And how many out of six were in the shaded area told you whether you had a score or not? Now every one of the responses has a, has a thing. So it might be one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, 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 four, or one, three, five, 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 you know, I that see. kind of thing. Right. You have to add up the scores, so it's a little bit trickier. Right. But presumably, we've checked on this. We've done some rigorous research, and we show that 93.5% of primary care physicians can add to five. <laughs> and, That's good. Uh, and, they can, and they can add these six things up to come to 30. So the score goes between zero and 30. You know, that if you have nothing, you have zero. And the highest you can have is five points on each of the six items. So you have a 
score of 30. And you just count up the things, add them up to 30. And uh, we have this bandwidth that if you're in the range 0 to 8, it means this. And if you're 9 to 12, it means this and so forth. Right. And it's just much more precise than it was in the past and can be done lickety split. So we, we're really very happy with, uh, with it. And we're, uh, we're also happy that we were able to update it for DSM-5. So it turns out there's quite a few people with ADHD who were on the edge. And that's why DSM-5 made this change, you know, instead of having six symptoms, five symptoms. Mm -hmm. But there's quite a few people who have sort of this sub-threshold uh, or what used to be sub-threshold uh, ADHD that, in fact, is getting in the way of their lives. So uh, to be able to change the scale so that we change the threshold to capture those people is something that's important from a public health point of view as well. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned before the short form and the long form. And the long form, I believe you're talking about 18-question checklist, which was the nine yeah. hyperactive symptoms and the nine inattentive symptoms. Is that checklist going to change as a result? No, uh, the checklist is still the, uh, the same. And in fact, we have an expanded checklist that Len Adler and his colleagues have put together. And it is, as you know, there's a lot of controversy about what the, what the right symptoms for adult ADHD are. Although in DSM-5, they've been kept to be the same as for kids. There's a lot of evidence that executive function kind of problems become much more dominant in, a, in adulthood, and the kind of questions you need to ask to capture them correctly are not the same as you would ask for kids. So the full ASRS has not just the 18 questions, but in addition has some, uh, some questions based on clinical experience that are trying to flesh out this this uh, broader spectrum of uh, executive dysfunction disorder. As it happens, uh, when we analyze the data, two of the six items that came in were not DSM-5 items. They were not among the 18. Mm. Uh, and we're still getting come up with diagnoses based on DSM-5, but it turns out that in order to find people who have those DSM-5 diagnoses, the kind of questions you would ask that would say, oh, yeah, I have that. that. That sounds like me. Other questions besides DSM questions are ones that are more sensitive for picking that up. Yes. So, again, that's another an interesting thing. So in the future, as we uh, learn more and more about the phenomenology of ADHD and the subtyping and so forth, I, I'm almost positive the diagnostic criteria will change. And I think along the lines that uh, we find in this expanded version. But the expanded version with 18 and then beyond that with these others are things that are good for clinicians to use. So they found people who screen in with the six questions to flesh out the full syndrome. This quick screen misses virtually nobody. Just by asking six questions, and we're talking about literally a minute and a half, right. uh, you'll be able to say, okay, you, we don't have to worry about. And then you hone in on the people in a typical practice who had these kind of problems, and, uh, and then you can pull out the longer list and get the more fleshed out understanding of what's going on in their lives. Great. We've been speaking with Ronald Kessler, PhD. He's going to be speaking at the upcoming meeting of APSARD this coming January 13th to 15th at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. You'll hear Ron plus many other very motivating speakers. Thanks, Ron, for being with us. My pleasure. Look forward to seeing you in January.